Hello, good evening here in the UK. Um, good afternoon or more late morning in most of the US uh, and very late night in most of Asia if you're joining us from there. Um, welcome to another in our series of online discussions uh, from the Center for Geopolitics here at the University of Cambridge. Um, let me just say the outlet out, outset. Um, if you are joining us online and you have a question at any point, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen to enter that question. Uh, we will answer all questions that we can at the end of the program. Um, and when asking a question, please do include your name and affiliation in the text box if possible. Also, uh, we certainly welcome everyone joining us today to follow our uh, website and uh, social media channels, uh, as well as the YouTube channel on which uh, recordings of events uh, are often posted. Uh, information on how to do that is now posted in the chat. So today we're extremely fortunate to be joined by Professor Taylor Fravel, uh, who is the David and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science and Director of the Security Studies Program at MIT. Uh, and we're going to be talking about sort of various aspects of politics in the run up to the 20th Party Congress uh, that's about to open in a couple of weeks uh, in Beijing. And so I thought I might just get started by asking him to elaborate uh, on pretty much any topic he wants, um, but maybe particularly uh, with some emphasis on the foreign policy and security uh, arena. Uh, and uh, then, then we can just sort of take it from there and free-floating conversation. So, Tyler, if you'd like to. Great. Um, thanks, Bill. It's a real pleasure to be here. My only regret uh, is that we're not doing this in person. Uh, uh, would be delighted to visit Cambridge at some point in the future. Um, so I guess, you know, there are two issues, narrow issues in terms of the Congress I'm tracking, but have broader implications, which, you know, concern both personnel and policy in both the foreign affairs uh, system and then the national defense uh, system. Um, and so what I've been thinking about just the last few days, um, I mean, we'll know the answer soon, but is, you know, uh, how to sort of deal with the very significant uh, turnover we're going to have in the leadership of uh, both of these areas. So in the foreign affairs area, um, uh, both uh, Yang uh, Jia Chur, the he head of or director of the Central Foreign Affairs Office of the Central Committee, uh, and then uh, the foreign minister Wang Yi uh, will uh, be uh, older than 67, uh, and so uh, likely will step down from their posts. So my working assumption here, uh, which I think will bear out, but you know could change, uh, is that the sort of 67 up, 68 down uh, rule, I won't really call it a norm, I'm not sure it's a norm, but it does seem to be a very handy rule, uh, will hold in terms convention, of rough convention, convention, preference, right. um, you know, you can sometimes break it, but most of the time it, it seems to serve a decent function, uh, which is why I think it will be uh, maintained, but it could be bent in a few places. But but if, if we believe that to be um, sort of something that will guide personnel decisions, then we're going to have an entire new sort of foreign affairs leadership team be selected, uh, which itself, I think, is, is a very momentous moment, a momentous change at a time when foreign affairs in China has probably never been a more important uh, uh, for the party. Then likewise, if we look at the Central Military Commission, which oversees um, uh, sort of China's armed forces, including the People's Liberation Army, the People's Armed Police, and the militia, uh, there, it, it, so this commission lately has had seven members uh, chaired by Xi Jinping, but the other six are uniformed PLA officers. And four of these six, uh, including both vice chairman uh, as well as the defense minister and the chief of the joint staff department will also uh, age out as they'll be either in their late 60s or early 1970s, suggesting that we're going to have four new members of the Central Military Commission. And, and as I'll get to in a minute, maybe even more, because the two who are left are not necessarily logical candidates to become a vice chairman, kind of in my view. Uh, and then, you know, after all these personnel issues, there, the real question is, what does this mean for policy? Maybe we can have a more open-ended uh, discussion on that point. But starting first with um, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Central Foreign Affairs Office, uh, I did look uh, recently just at the list of delegates uh, the, to the 20th Party Congress on uh, the assumption that anyone elected to the Central Committee who, who would be able to sort of take these, to hold these important offices would be 
uh, chosen from uh, the delegates. And so this immediately eliminates three people who, who, whose names have been in the running at some point in 2020. Uh, Song Tao, uh, who had been head of the International Liaison Department for the party, retired last this past summer. Uh, he's not listed as a delegate and so likely um, not, not a candidate to take over Yang Jiechur as uh, director of the Central Foreign Affairs Office. Uh, Le Yucheng, who was, um, I think, the, a very senior vice uh, foreign minister uh, in charge of Russia policy, uh, somewhat surprisingly was transferred uh, to the National Broadcasting Administration. Uh, he's also not listed as a delegate, and, and many people thought he might have been foreign minister, so he's out of the running. And then one of uh, Yang um, Jiechur's current deputies, uh, uh, Deng Hongbao, is not also listed as a delegate, so out of the running. So who does this leave? Um, it leaves uh, Liu Jiayi, who's uh, 64, heading the Taiwan Affairs Office. office. It leaves uh, Liu Jianchao, uh, who's younger at 58, now running the International Liaison Department, but he's only uh, been in that position for a few months after replacing uh, Song Tao. Then within the foreign ministry, there are a few folks. There's uh, Ma uh, Zhao Shu, who's a senior uh, vice foreign minister at the age of 59, and then Hua Chengying, um, who is 52. Uh, these two, along with the, the two Leos, have, uh, all, are all delegates uh, to the upcoming Congress, and that's potentially you know, eligible for election to the Central Committee and higher posts. Um, and then there are two kind of dark horses. Uh, one is uh, Liu Haixing, who's 59. I think he's a deputy director of, of the National or State Security Commission, um, but he has a ministerial rank, at least according to some of, of the Hong Kong press. And a few of the pieces uh, that have been authored in the past few months on sort of speculating about these posts have included him um, uh, for something. Um, uh, what that is, is not entirely clear. His background uh, before heading over to the NSC was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but he never rose above um, uh, a sort of department director level, although he was did have the rank of a uh, vice foreign minister, uh, but never been an ambassador or, or had any major overseas uh, postings. And the other dark horse is uh, Yang Jiechur's other deputy, uh, Sun Shu Xian, who is um, uh, 56, but comes from the state sort of oceanic administration in the China Coast Guard. Um, not a lot of necessarily international experience or foreign affairs experience. And so like if I had, since you've asked for predictions, if I had to sort of predict from this, uh, I think I would, I would say that Liu Jiayi is most likely to become director of the Central Foreign Affairs Office, assuming that it um, maintains its current prominence. And I say this not just because of his, he's had varied experience, uh, not just in the Taiwan Affairs Office, also in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with postings at the UN, as well as in the International Liaison Department. So he's kind of, you know, he, he has had experience in many of the main foreign affairs uh, related uh, uh, actors that would be coordinated by the Central Foreign Affairs Office. He's also currently a member of the Central Committee, unlike any of the others that I've listed, and that you know, just sort of reflects his seniority. Um, uh, this leaves an open question as who would uh, sort of uh, take over as foreign minister. Um, I guess we could be surprised by the two dark horses that I mentioned. Um, but I, I sort of wonder if Ma Jashu is, is the logical uh, candidate here, um, uh, since uh, it would, I think, need to be someone with decent familiarity and experience within the ministry itself. Um, now, of course, I, I am leaving out uh, Leo Jenchao. Uh, I think he'll probably stay at the International Liaison Department. But uh, there have been so many personnel transfers in the last few years. Uh, it is not impossible that he could be transferred to a higher post as well. Um, Perhaps the bigger question though is what ranks these people will have. And so in the current setup, uh, Yang Jiechur is a member of the Politburo, as well as director of the Central Foreign Affairs Office. And uh, Wang Yi, uh, for the last, that's for the last five years for Yang, and Wang Yi has been a state counselor, as well as a minister, uh, which has, I think, enabled him to serve um, beyond for the general retirement age uh, for ministers. Um, so that same setup could be maintained, uh, which I think would reflect the way or the importance of elevating uh, foreign affairs uh, for the party um, and to have someone on the Politburo, right, who is, is uh, leading that system. Um, but of course, it may be the case that only the head of the foreign affairs office makes it to the Politburo and the, the minister uh, doesn't, uh, or perhaps, perhaps the head of the foreign affairs office doesn't make it to the Politburo, which would also be interesting. And like Dai Bingguo under Hu Jintao uh, just holds the, site, the title of a uh, 
state counselor. The other really wild card here, and I was just thinking of like crazy things that might happen. Um, maybe Leo J. E. becomes foreign minister, but also joins the Politburo. And uh, the, the, the role of the Central Foreign Affairs Office is downgraded a bit such that Leo J. E. really uh, is uh, the one that uh, sort of uh, speaks for China on foreign affairs issues and plays a, a central role in guiding or advising uh, Xi Jinping on foreign policy. And here the model would be uh, Chen Chi Chen from the 1990s when he was both a member of the Politburo and foreign minister for roughly 10 years. And, and the, the foreign affairs office, which went to a few different titles in the early 90s, uh, was under uh, a man named Liu Huacho, but who did, did sort of serve more uh, in the background and did not hold as high of a rank in the party as Chen Chi Chen did. So there are different ways in which perhaps foreign affairs could be consolidated. Um, and that's something to, to sort of watch uh, pretty closely. On the CMC side, I think it's more interesting uh, in some ways uh, because of uh, the importance of the way the CMC is set up. So as I mentioned, Xi Jinping is the chair. I fully expect he'll be elected to a third term and remain as chair. Then you have two vice chairmen. Um, and the, the, the current vice chairman, uh, one has served for two terms for 12 years, the other for five years, but they also play an important role on sort of this uh, sort of defense or PLA reform leading group. And they both have extensive experience in operations versus political work. Um, the two, um, and then sorry, the other four positions uh, uh, that need to be filled with uniform PLA officers is position of defense minister. It's often the third ranking position. Uh, uh, chief of the Joint Staff Department, which sort of head of operations, uh, the political warfare uh, department director, and then uh, sort of discipline and inspection. So the two who are left, uh, uh, because the other four are going to age out, are, are, are Miao Hua, who's currently uh, director for political warfare, and uh, Zhang Shengming, who's the head of the discipline inspection body. They Neither of them have extensive experience in operations. They both have actually been um, political commissars for their entire career at a time when, um, um, excuse me, uh, my phone is ringing, um, uh, at a time when um, um, you know, political, political work itself has been sort of downgraded uh, to some degree and much less important than, than operational experience. Um, um, so, so what I am expecting might happen is that someone is gonna be elevated uh, from outside of the CMC to take the position. Oh, sorry, the last thing about uh, Miao Hua and Zheng Shengming, right? They both could only serve for one term, right? Because one is 66, the other is 64. And so they wouldn't be eligible uh, to sort of maintain some of that continuity we've seen previously in sort of the vice chairmanship uh, of the Central Military Commission. And given you know, the rapid pace of modernization, I think that's pretty important. And so this suggests that uh, one or more, uh, more individuals are going to be brought up from outside of the Central Military Commission itself to serve as vice chairman. Um, one name that comes to mind is uh, Li Chaoming, who is the former um, uh, Northern Theater Commander, which is sort of one of the most important theater commands, especially with respect to North Korean defense of the capital. Also served in a number of, of the group armies in that area. The other is uh, Liu Zhenli, one of the last individuals uh, with um, any kind of uh, actual combat experience. Uh, he was most recently uh, commander of uh, the ground forces um, and very curiously has no longer been commander, but is actually was seen on video wearing a patch uh, that associates him with the Central Military Commission. And so I think Liu Zhenli might actually be elevated to be one of the two vice chairmen. Maybe Ma, uh, Miao Hua would be the other one. Uh, and then Ali uh, Chaoming might uh, come in and become a chief of uh, the Joint Staff Department. And for the other ones, it's a little hard to say, but, but it is going to be refreshed uh, quite significantly. Um, and the reason why I, I think uh, folks are going to have to be brought up from outside the CMC to lead it is, is right, the overriding priority on defense policy for um, uh, the party today, right, is continued modernization, making progress with respect to this 2027 benchmark, uh, achieving the modernization goals of 2035 and 2049. And that I don't think will be effectively uh, managed by those who come from a political sort of warfare background. On the other hand, if uh, both Miao Hua and Cheng Chengming do become the vice chairman, it suggests that uh, political concerns, right, are going to be as important uh, for the party or for Xi himself and the PLA as operational concerns. 
And that uh, sort of um, is a way of reviving the old uh, debate of, you know, is it better to be read or expert? Um, uh, or is it better to be lo lo loyal uh, to Xi than necessarily the most competent uh, kind of warfighter? Um, but to, to achieve China's kind of ambitious military goals, it's going to need some pretty competent warfighters um, running uh, the Central Military Commission. So in terms of the, the work report itself, things I'm curious to know more about in terms of foreign policy and um, defense policy. On the foreign policy side, of course, uh, how China describes its relationship to the international system and global governance, and to get a sense of if China uh, is making more concrete in any way some of its, I think to this point, quite vague uh, global kind of ambitions and aspirations, which are sort of discussed in very kind of lofty but ambiguous terms uh, to something sort of more concrete than that. I'm also very interested if there's going to be um, sort of inclusion, I'm sure there will be, uh, just I guess it's more how it's included, but the global security initiative that Xi Jinping first uh, introduced uh, in April at the Boao conference. Um, also uh, what uh, is gonna be discussed with respect to Taiwan, if there's anything that's different from the recent white paper, or any sense of, of a timeline or a change in urgency. Uh, I don't think that will be the case in the work report, but still worth uh, sort of watching closely. Then on the defense side, um, you know, the fourth plenum in 2020 and in the, in the, you know, uh, the 14th five-year plan, there was this inclusion of a new benchmark that I just referenced of 2027. And sometimes that is viewed as, as code, uh, although I think inaccurately is when the PLA may uh, invade Taiwan or may want to be ready to invade Taiwan. And so if 2027 is described with different language than it has been so far, I think that would be a very important uh, signal, and then more generally, uh, uh, how the 2035 and 20, uh, 2049 benchmarks are described. But my overall view, overall view on the work report, I know it's getting a little beyond the foreign and, and defense areas, is that you know the 19th Party Congress really set out, like I think, the ambitious goals, right, in terms of the new principle contradiction, uh, you know, when to achieve modernization and so forth, and the 2035 and 2049 benchmarks apply to the economy and the society more generally. These are not just military benchmarks that, like the most interesting information we might find from this work report, right, will be in the second half that kind of provides more detail as to how China is going to go about sort of achieving those goals. I don't think the goals themselves at this point are, are likely to change. So uh, let me wrap up here and uh, turn it back to you, Bill. Well, that's fantastic and tremendously detailed uh, set of predictions as well as analysis of, of what's going on with the personnel changes and what may be going on with policy adjustments. One thing that strikes me as very interesting, two aspects of it actually, is that first of all, we're seeing a transition quite likely to a younger generation and a more quote unquote expert, to use that old red expert dichotomy, uh, generation of leaders in these key areas. And the second aspect of things, it seems like we may actually see not necessarily a stepping back from the ambitious agenda set in the 19th Party Congress, but at least not necessarily a, a ramping up of, of a global ambition. Um, and so I wonder, do you think it might be that at the global scale, China might take a bit of a step back, even if it takes a bit of a step forward at the more regional level uh, within its own neighborhood. Does that does that make any sense as a, as a possible direction? It, it certainly makes sense. I, I don't think China will step necessarily step back uh, globally, but I don't, I don't think it will accelerate the pace mm. of its initiatives, right, which, you know, sort of continued growth. I mean, China clearly has placed great emphasis on anchoring multilateralism in the United Nations, yeah. uh, playing a very big role in that institution. I fully expect that to deepen and to continue. Um, you know, the Belt and Road uh, it clearly has uh, slowed down. Um, and in that sense, so, 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 so the global economic uh, areas, I think they're ongoing readjustments that you know, certainly predate the Congress, but uh, will continue. Um, and just in terms of China's lending uh, overall, right, has slowed. Um, it also depends on how much independent weight you want to give to the Belt and Road versus China's economic incentives to engage yeah. in overseas lending. Um, but you know, the Belt and Road seems to have gone through a few different uh, characterizations that um, my colleague at um, BU Minya has talked about a lot. And I think that 
right? Like it's not going away, but what but what it is and what it means, I think uh, uh, will continue to change. And so the one area for growth here is the global security initiative. Yeah. Um, and just the other day, Sheena uh, Greitens has a very interesting essay in foreign affairs. Um, she and I have a bit of a friendly disagreement about this, uh, or at least my attitude is like, show me the beef. Like, I don't know what is yet really new about the Global Security Initiative because each of the six points that Xi Jinping included in the Boa speech are all, all kind of key uh, planks of China's uh, foreign uh, sort of approach to foreign affairs and diplomacy. So there wasn't like- For quite some time. Too, you know, yeah, for quite some time. But there wasn't really anything that said, oh, okay, this will now be the new mm. sort of area of focus. And also I think, um, you know, in, in Chinese, right, it's Chang'e, which has a very different connotation than initiative in English, which kind of suggests an action plan. And so my sense is that will get, that will be a work in progress. It may be a way of rebranding or relabeling a series of activities that might have been somewhat less related and thus conveying the weight of kind of greater influence and momentum. I, th I actually think this is a bit of how the Belt and Road worked in practice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, activities that were on, you know, ongoing in the economic sphere um, that may have happened anyway, all of a sudden became part of something bigger called the Belt and Road. And it seemed to have a lot mm -hmm. of momentum and initiative, especially you know, I think leading up to 2019. And so I think that, you know, one area, you know, I, I guess where, where we just have to wait and see will be if there's a concerted effort in the next few years to really flesh out uh, the content of the global security initiative and then to see what um, specific policies or, or programmatic actions it produces that are, that would be different from simply, um, increasing what China is already doing or, or increasing the frequency with, of activities uh, China is already undertaking. Well, but, I mean, in, a, in a really minimalist way, it might just be cover for the belt tightening on the Belt and Road. It, it could play that role too, because as you, as you know, right, there's also a global development initiative, right. which may actually be a bit more developed, pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but now we, you know, but, but since development and security are also related, we have mm. We have both of these um, kind of initiatives uh, moving in in parallel, but I guess uh, you know more generally, right? The the there are lots of foreign policy challenges in the region, yeah, um, and those will not be solved by a party congress work report, um, and and uh, will be quite um, you know are, are sharpening whether it's the change in government in South Korea, you know, ongoing kind of uh, growing ongoing increase in tensions over Taiwan. A deterioration of ties with the United States, perhaps a somewhat cooling of ties with Japan, right. um, even even somewhat sort of um, what's the right word here, uh, sort of uh, sort of slow ties with Southeast Asia, especially with respect mm -hmm. to dealing with the South China Sea and the Code of Conduct, which yeah. I think has made made very little progress. Uh, and then more generally, globally, um, I think China's support for Russia in the war in Ukraine. Um, it's diplomatic, you know, and rhetorical support, not material support, which hasn't occurred yet. But I think helped accelerate a shift in Europe that was already underway, in which Europe became much more cautious and concerned about a stronger China, yeah. um, and a much more cautious and concerned about some of uh, China's efforts in Central and Eastern Europe. So you have the seventeen plus one mechanism yeah. now down to fourteen plus one, um, uh, which says to me that. Yeah, I think it's going to be hard for China to repair ties with Europe quickly, mm -hmm. uh, although it will try. But I think it, it means that the global push will most likely be in the developing world where China will see the greatest opportunity. Um, and maybe that's where you know, we, we will see the greatest kind of global effort. But in part, it's because because it's hard to it's hard to for, for China to engage with other parts of the world, given uh, some of the policy positions that it's taken. True. And I think that there may also be some limitations in, in outreach to parts of the developing world just that are geographically distant yeah. from China. I mean, it's not obvious to me, for example, how much more China can do to engage with countries in Africa or Latin America than it's already doing. I mean, it already has some substantial engagement with some countries in those regions, but um, but given the distance, it's not obvious they can do much more. Given the politics of the way things have gone in the last say 10 to 15 years, it's also not obvious to me that Central Asia or Southeast Asia are easy 
targets for deeper engagement than they already have with again with specific countries in the region and very much to the consternation of some other countries in those same regions um let's talk about sort of three big issues and then some three bilateral relationships mm -hmm. and then i'd like to circle back to one last question about the personnel changes actually uh, if there's time uh, before we open up to questions uh you know i always think of china having sort of three really big security issues right on its frontier right and you know uh it might be interesting to to think about this in the context of the party congress and so if we have sort of the korean peninsula taiwan and south china sea i mean in the korean peninsula as you pointed out we've got a change of government in south korea uh that looks to be much less favorable to closer dealings with china uh north korea it's hard to say exactly at least i don't see clearly what's going on uh, in politics inside North Korea, but they've just you know, launched another ballistic missile over right. Japan within the last 24 hours. Um, so what what's changing in the Korea situation that might be affected by any decisions taken at the party Congress? If we do see a shift, what might that shift look like? And, and if we don't see a shift, how sustainable is China's current posture vis-a-vis -vis Korea? Well, yeah, the Korean Peninsula has always been a a thorn in China's strategic mm. side, as it were. And yeah. you know, the missile test, I think, makes that very clear mm. uh, because uh, part of what um, you know, drives South Korea's sort of diplomatic and foreign policy calculus is who can help it more with North Korea. Yeah. Um, and clearly, uh, at the moment, it doesn't look like China can help South Korea with North Korea, uh, given, and there have been more tests recently that were of different systems but this you know launch over japan was quite significant it hadn't happened in five years i mean it's almost like someone's crying for attention yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and so the consequence seems to be right that uh, especially given the political sort of leanings of the new south korean government that it is going to lean much more towards strengthening the alliance uh, with the united states further uh, yeah. to deal with north korea uh, but that of course has implications for china and perhaps even um overcoming some of the friction, I think this will be much harder to do between Korea and Japan itself, right? Mm -hmm. So in some ways the US alliance system is somewhat handicapped at the moment because uh, although the US has good relations with both uh, Seoul, right. Seoul and Tokyo, Seoul and Tokyo don't have great relations no. with each other, which is something perhaps China could exploit too down mm -hmm. the road. But um, uh, so I think, you know, but China may look at this situation and, and see uh, an ever greater Kind of tightening of the U.S. presence and a, a more pressing challenge from their standpoint. Um, uh, if if uh, there is this um, sort of continued uh, strengthening of the U.S. South Korean alliance, then of course we have um, uh, the AUKUS agreement involving you know Australia and the United Kingdom to in the United States to build nuclear yeah. uh, powered submarines, which uh, a is continuing to progress. Although I'm skeptical if the submarines will. In fact, be built, but the alliance, you know, that defense relationship is tightening, which is the broader point. And then China, at the most recent, I believe it was NPT conference, uh, had sort of uh, an anti AUKUS um, document it was trying to gain support for, or that was criticizing AUKUS and then had to withdraw it for a lack of support, which sort of indicates that, um, you know, whether it's from the Northeast or from the South, right, that the US. Uh, is is sort of strengthening its position in the region. Um, and then of course we have Taiwan as well. Let, let's talk a little bit about Taiwan. I mean, there's in, in recent months uh, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, on sort of both sides of the question of does the Russia-Ukraine war make uh, Chinese military action over Taiwan more or less likely? Uh, I tend to think if anything, it makes it less likely and probably doesn't have a very strong effect at all one way or the other. But aside from that, I mean, there's a sort of a larger conversation to be had about how stable is the status quo uh, over Taiwan? Uh, and to what degree is China likely to push harder uh, for closer ties with, with Taiwan or for eventual moves towards unification, not just preventing moves towards uh, independence uh, and to what extent is that going to shape overall dynamics of say the US China relationship uh, or Japan China relationship for that matter oh, and how might all that be affected by the party Congress <laughs> yeah. 
Well, the, yeah, the party Congress, I guess itself, right, is, you know, I mean, it, it, if one believes it to be kind of Xi Jinping's coronation right. as, uh, I, I'm always hesitant to say the most powerful leader since X, but his coronation as, you know, a very powerful Chinese mm. leader, um, you know, with with elements that could rival, I suppose, Mao or Deng in different areas, although maybe Liu Xiaoqi as well on the party side, um, right? So, so um, you know, he, if, if he feels, uh, and it's reflected in the work report, right, that, that the trends are really moving in China's favor overall, and thus China can be a bit even more assertive on Taiwan, um, then I think, you know, one consequence of the party Congress might be to sort of accelerate non-military means of, trying to uh, sort of speed up um, a framework or a time frame for negotiations, not that there would be a timetable. Now, the most recent white paper doesn't seem to reflect this. Um, and given its uh, publication so close to the party Congress, yeah. I have to believe that, that, that the sections on Taiwan and the party Congress work report will look very will similar to the look very paper, similar. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, it would, it would, it would uh, raise or, or it just strikes me as settled party policy. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be very unlikely for that to be changed. And my understanding is that that white paper itself had been drafted for some time, right? It, it wasn't yeah. quite drafted immediately in response to Pelosi's visit. It was sort no. of the occasion upon which it could be released. Um, and so, so um, um, you know, that, that does sort of, you know, parts of that white paper do sort of suggest a more uh, assertive approach, but not one that would be necessarily radically different um, from uh, the current pace of assertiveness, which, which is not insignificant. Uh, you know, it does not include certain things that were included in previous statements, such as the stationing of, or not stationing of troops and administrative personnel. Uh, Xi Jinping also did not include that in his 2019 speech, I believe, so it's not an entirely new Sort of omission, but it but it does sort of suggest a hardening of what the terms of unification might be, and a, a and sort of a, a less a lesser willingness to compromise. Um, but you know the status quo is is very dynamic across the strait because it's a function of you know at least three uh, actors and their policies, right? Uh, Taipei, Washington, and Beijing, um, and it could change significantly. Um, by uh, actions that either one of those three actors take. Um, you know, Taiwan has presidential elections coming up in 2024. Yeah. Here in the United States, we have midterms coming up, which if the House, uh, sorry, if the Republicans take back control of the House could uh, just produce many more hearings critical of the Biden administration. I'd manage there'd be many more hearings on uh, China policy or on Taiwan. We have the Taiwan Policy Act. Uh, before Congress, which who knows if it would pass and in what form, but for the, the original form, I think would be viewed as quite a significant propagation from China. And then you have China's basically, you know, I think gradual sort of weakening of patience, especially in light of kind of US policy um, towards improving ties with Taipei and kind of Taiwan's enthusiasm about a lot of what has happened recently. And so, so um, I think it's quite, dynamic um, and, and quite interactive such that, you know, once you know, China might make the first move post party Congress, which will uh, elicit greater support from, you know, the United States if it's seen as fur further squeezing uh, Taiwan, for example, we just saw I think Paraguay ask for a billion dollars in aid yeah. from Taiwan. I guess that's the price of, that's the price of uh, friendship or of recognition. And, uh, you know, if, if, Paraguay goes, which is one of the bigger countries still recognizing yep. Taiwan. I think that would be seen as a, a real challenge uh, um, and clearly must be in play. Otherwise, it wouldn't have come up. Um, um, uh, I think oh, I, I, I think there's some pretty interesting changes domestically too, both in Taiwan and the U.S. Hmm. from China's point of view that maybe make things a bit harder um, or, or at least constrain the room to maneuver, perhaps. Uh, from China's point of view, and I wonder what your take on that is. That you know, Biden uh, has been articulating what I would take to be 
fairly clearly a more strident interpretation of the Taiwan Relations Act uh, than has previously been publicly articulated by most of his democratic predecessors. Um, democratic with a large D in this case, right? The, right? There there are many sort of on the right in US politics who would applaud, I think, this, this more uh, muscular uh, view, but on the left, it, it's, it's not been usually shared, uh, or at least not publicly uh, proclaimed as, as such. So there's that and the sort of closing off of uh, more conciliatory policy space, it seems, in the U.S., more conciliatory towards China uh, policy space within the U.S. And within Taiwan politics, I mean, we see this kind of almost crumbling of the Guomindang and of, of most of the pan-blue coalition. I mean, I have no idea who's going to run in 2024, and that, that's another sort of game if we if we want to get into yeah. speculating on who the presidential candidates in Taiwan are going to be, but uh, or indeed who's going to win in the U.S. 2024 elections uh, for president. But it doesn't look likely to me that that there's going to be a resurgence of pan blue or certainly not uh, political forces in Taiwan that are friendly to a unification agenda. Does that change the the Chinese calculus? Do you think the, those developments in Taiwan and in the U.S. Well, I think, I think ever since Tsai Ing-wen's election, is my somewhat layman's interpretation of Chinese policy has been is that they, that they sort of treated Tsai as if that change had already happened, mm -hmm. right? That the space had closed and you know, they began to put pressure on the new government very quickly to bend the knee on one China and the 92 consensus and have mm -hmm. just not let up. Um, so in some ways, I think, and that I think is fed into all sorts of calculations on Taiwan itself, especially after the national security law in Hong Kong. And so, uh, so perhaps the setting aside what might happen in the election, who would run, um, and what their previous positions on independence have been, and there's some who have, like I, was it Lai Jingde has described himself as an independence worker, um, and so forth. I would I think attract a lot of concern in China. Um, so there, there may, so, so the variable that China may pay more attention to is really US support for Taiwan. And so in this context, um, and the weakening of, of, of the one China policy of the United States, or uh, certainly changes in its implementation that, you know, raise questions about whether or not the policy itself is, uh, ha has changed. And the, you know, President Biden's statements clearly are, are a shift in in the direction of a pretty significant change. Um, uh, they always happen in live TV interviews, um, you know, uh, and then very quickly, you know, it, now, right, the White House comes out to say there's been no change. And even within that week, right, his statement at the UN was different than a statement in that 60 minutes interview. Um, but nevertheless, I think it reflects, and I have no idea, I have no special insight here, but it, it would seem to reflect kind of what, what he personally thinks. Uh, that that is often very close to what policy is, but maybe in this case it's it's slightly different, um, given the policy statements uh, to the contrary. But I think, but I I do think, or what I sort of focus on a lot is Chinese assessments of kind of the credibility of the U.S. one China policy, and if a series of events come together uh, uh, which make them believe it's no longer credible, I think that would lead that could lead to a change in their approach. Um, I don't think it necessarily. Uh, means that China moves immediately to, you know, retaking the island by force. No, I think the war in Ukraine has revealed how uncertain modern warfare is, uh, and um, how hard it is to command uh, in modern warfare. And what China would attempt to do in amphibious assault is orders of is much more complicated by orders of magnitude than what mm -hmm. Russia is attempting to, to do in Ukraine, which is primarily just a ground force combined arms operation. They are not even succeeding very well at that. And so, but, but I think it would increase pressure and coercion in other forms, uh, economic pressure, um, cyber uh, elements as well. Uh, and that would sort of be, I mean, some of those are already ongoing. And so I think they would be accelerated. It's important not to, I mean, it's important to note that China's already putting a lot of pressure on Taiwan. Oh yes. So, and, and, and I don't want to leave the impression that they're not. So I, I'm thinking more like, will they do more? And I think they would do more under those circumstances because I, I think, as you know, they probably, the mainland's probably concluded for some time that Taiwan politics is not going to um, change in a way that's kind of favorable to their preferences. I guess that's probably true. I, I, I was less certain 
that the mainland has made such a calculus um, in the past that, uh, you know, political power has shifted back and forth between sort of DPP and, and KMT in Taiwan for a while. Uh, and previously, I mean, if we look at the contrast, for example, in the way that uh, the mainland treated the Chen shui administration versus the Ma Ying-jeou sure. administration, right? That they, they were very adept at shifting sort of posture when it came to which party was in power. Um, it's interesting if they really did decide much earlier in, in the Tsai administration that basically there's no hope for the KMT coming back into power. Well, I guess I'm sure it's less that there's no hope, but not, but, but it, they, they appeared to conclude pretty early on that she would not say the words that they had asked. No, her she's not say. going. Yeah. Right. right. And there's no way she would say that. I mean, as she, indeed Chen shui Bian wouldn't either. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> And, and she's a much, she's a much more pragmatic politician than Chen Shui Bian, and but she's much smarter than he was. I very very effective, right. you know, president. Um, but I, I think you know maybe maybe I don't know what the time. I'm sort of speculating here, right? but but it seemed that you know they didn't hear what they wanted to hear in her inaugural address. Right. Uh, there was more pressure. They still didn't hear, and and they've decided not to maintain any you know contact or communications. And now you know that was 2016, 17 time frame. It's 2022, right? right? So so it, it seems that they would seem to have made that that kind of a judgment that they can't shift the approach yeah. under her administration. No, not not so long as she remains in office. And, and if and if the DPP continues to sort of maintain be the dominant political force, and that right. would, likely they wouldn't change under at least they wouldn't become more moderate under any new DPP administration. Let's talk very briefly about the South China Sea, and then we can segue into sort of US, Japan, and Russia mm -hmm. relationships, um, if, if you like, if there's time, uh, and or move to questions uh, after that. But you know, in, the, in the Taiwan space, we're dealing with really at least three players. Right? In the Korean Peninsula, we're dealing with at least four, maybe five players. In the South China Sea, we've got really multiple players. Right. right? I mean, you've got not just the US uh, as a major naval presence, as well as China, uh, but all kinds of regional powers as well. I mean, uh, Indonesia, as referenced in the the photo of Sukarno on the wall behind me, is uh, you know sees itself at least as a major regional power, if not sure, regional yeah. hegemon in the region uh, or within the South China Sea area uh, or the North Natuna Sea, if we want to be uh, respectful of the way it's looking from the south. Um, we've got Vietnam, we've got Philippines, um, a bunch of different countries that all have overlapping claims with each other that have different sets of interests around freedom of navigation and control of different sea lanes, um, and that also have differing views of both China and the United States. Right? Some of these are basically US allies. Some of these countries are, see themselves as non-aligned uh, and don't want to get too close to either side uh, and sort of play both off against each other. And you know, some others are more friendly to China, although they tend to be not the ones with major naval presence in the South China Sea. Um, how do you see this situation evolving? This is this is a really complex set of issues that that could be changed, I would think, if China looked at it slightly differently. But in, in what way might China change its outlook and in what way might the current situation uh, come to, uh, if not a crisis point, at least a, a critical juncture vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the status quo? So I. I've maintained with Chinese colleagues for many years that the mm -hmm. South China Sea disputes are very easy to solve mm -hmm. uh, because uh, um, in the sense that one can apply the general principle of possession is nine tenths of the law. There's a Latin term for this, which I cannot pronounce uh, properly, uti sedatus, I think, uh, but forgive me. I know there are Latin speakers in Cambridge who will know, know, know that this is not correct, but, but, but you know, each claimant could keep the features that they hold. They would mm. agree not to seize features from each other. And, and um, because China's far and away the strongest power, mm. right? The disposition of land features really doesn't matter from mat its material capabilities, no. uh, right? Because its Navy will, will, will be the dominant Navy in the South China Sea, regardless uh, of whether it gets back all nine Philippine held features or all 20 whatever Vietnamese held features and so forth. And so in that sense, um, you know, and historically when chi China has compromised in territorial disputes with weaker neighbors, often yeah. sort of not pressing its demands very hard. And, and so, the, which has worked in the sense of building trust with that weaker neighbor that its sovereignty will be respected. 
um, once the land, you know, these were all land border disputes, with yeah. one exception. And so, so in that sense, I think there's always been a deal on the table in terms of the islands. Um, but I think because they matter much more uh, for reasons of national identity and, and, and status, China has been unwilling to do that in some senses. It also wants those countries perhaps to bend the knee to some degree to China. Um, and that's unfortunate because it, its complexity means it's, it's ripe for escalation um, because of, there's so many actors involved in so, such close proximity in the US uh, and other seafaring states, right, have staked an important interest in navigation through the South China Sea, even yeah. setting aside US freedom navigation operations, just, just using it as a major right. you know, maritime highway. You look at any, any traffic, you know, maritime traffic map, it's there. Uh, and so the US is maintaining an active presence. I think this week it was conducting a joint exercise, anti-submarine warfare exercises with both Japan and Canada. Yeah. With I want to say seven vessels. Actually, it's not an insignificant exercise, not mm -hmm. widely reported, but um, I'm not sure where in the South China Sea it happened. It's actually a very large body of water, but yeah. um, uh, but but nevertheless, um, so in that sense, I think a deal, you know, China being the strongest actor can kind of in some ways dictate the terms of a deal. Um, and it, it could it could offer terms right that would actually be, I think, acceptable to most of the claimants uh, on terms of land features. If if it basically is this one where where we all agree to keep sort of what we have, no one will be happy with it. But that's the sign of a good deal. Keep what we have uh, and stop building new features. That's keep what we have. Stop, stop creating new features, these new artificial know, islands. Right. Like, you know, um, and there are a few. You know, this Scarborough Shoal could be very tricky here because. Mm. No one, China kind of controls the water, but no one's physically on it. But, um, and then the second question is what to do with maritime jurisdiction. And here, right, um, we have the nine dash line that uh, China has drawn, never really formally defined, but has made a formal part of its position in the South China Sea in 2016, when the tribunal rejected any claim to historic rights, China included a provision or included a line in its government statement, right, that it claimed historic rights in the South China Sea. And most mm -hmm. observers, including myself, believe that to basically be delimited by the nine dash line itself. Mm -hmm. And in some areas, the overlap with, you know, the EEZs from the coast of Vietnam or from Malaysia, right, yeah. is quite considerable, 100 nautical miles yeah. or more. So greatly infringes upon um, their exclusive economic zones, which are very important for their own uh, economic development. And China has presently been pushing a policy of sort of uh, stating it it has a non-exclusive right to those waters, i.e. that any development where, these, where the EEZs and nine dash line overlap should be jointly developed by China and the coastal state, which of course completely upends the convention on the law of the yeah. sea, um, but nevertheless appears to be uh, China's position. And again, I think China has a lot of latitude here um, in terms of how it, it wants to implement it, how it wants to define the nine dash lines as it hasn't really defined it yet um and could define it very differently i think it would it would go a long way towards you know building much better stronger trust among these states but i think trying to for reasons of of status and identity and and also to some degree perhaps competition with the united states is very unwilling uh to do this and so what do i ex i expect um i expect we'll see you know the gradual Kind of escalating naval presences of both sides. I mean, this has been happening since 2016 when the actual land reclamation was built. I don't expect China to start seizing features from other countries because that would cross, you know, a kinetic threshold, which would probably greatly harm its relations with the region much more generally. Um, which are already could, not great. Which are already not great. And you could see a lot of intimidation, though. Mm -hmm. You know, swarming features with Coast Guard yeah. vessels or maritime militia vessels. And this happens with the Philippines yeah. in particular from time to time. I mean, Vietnam and China have a fascinatingly complex relationship because they're um, you know, both uh, you know, led by communist parties that have their own relations with each other as well as their state to state relations. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think Vietnam tries to balance you know, its national identity and pursuit of, of its claims, which, it, you know, believes very strongly in South China Sea, which with at least stability with China um, um, and, and sort of maintaining that relationship. And so uh, I, I view it more as a body of water prone to a military accident that could escalate into yeah. something further than a, a situation in which um, China will 
adopt a different um, sort of approach or tact uh, because it, at least so far, right, has decided does not want to use force and wants to try to you know, negotiate favorable terms. Uh, that's not happening through the code of conduct. Um, I think it would be very interesting to see what would happen if the other claimants decided to solve it on, the, by, on their own. Right, rather than have a uh, ASEAN negotiate with China, which doesn't make a lot of sense since mm. only four of the or five of the you know, four of the four or five um, of the ASEAN states have uh, uh, coastlines that abut the South China Sea, right, in the first place, and that have any direct stake. It doesn't strike me as something that has to be an ASEAN issue, right? They could come up with another mechanism. Um, they could invite China to participate in that, um, but they could also propose, right, okay, you know, this dispute has gone on long enough, let's keep what we have, or let's mutually, you know, disarm, I think that's less likely, you know, or, or withdraw, but, you know, keep what we have, don't militarize, um, and, and, and see if China is willing to sort of um, play ball. Um, I, again, I'm not optimistic that would happen, but, but there, are, there are other ways in which I think these countries could maybe take the initiative a little bit more than they have. That's certainly possible, although that might require them working together, which is also difficult. Oh, yes. I mean, so, so some of the countries involved are not used to working jointly uh, on, on no. important areas uh, no. in, in very productive ways. Uh, let's just talk very briefly, if you like, about uh, either the U.S. relations with, with China or Japan's or Russia's. Um, if I could push you just a bit, what about mm -hmm. Russia? This Russia-China relationship that... Uh, yeah the Russians seem to think is very important and very good. Um, China doesn't seem as comfortable with it, at least from what I can see. Um, but, you know, is Russia really that important of a partner for China or is it uh, a relationship they're kind of stuck with because they have to have some way of balancing the US and Japan and India? So there's a uh, sort of scholar anal analyst named Bobo Lo who called mm -hmm. it an axis of convenience. Mm -hmm back in 2007 mm -hmm. and i'm still kind of in the axis of convenience camp mm -hmm. um, i mean they have common interests no doubt and those yeah. are really very much anchored on shared concerns about sort of the united states u.s power and the US, sort of the role of the united states in the world although for very different reasons right uh, russia's concerns about nato are not china's concerns about no. nato uh, although china's sort of i think repeated that language in part because china is quite critical of u.s alliances in general, and you know, would like to, I think, weaken U.S. alliances in um, in in East Asia, uh, but but there have been few situations that I can think of where one side has uh, paid a, a heavy price to support the other side on something that is really the other side's core interest, mm -hmm. um, and instead they've adopted um, you know a set of common talking points about global order and some common sort of uh, positions in the United Nations uh, that in effort, uh, as they say, right, in their February 4th statement and other statements like to democratize international relations, i.e., which is code for you know, reducing the influence of the United States and increasing, you know, and its allies and increasing you know, influence for uh, other important power centers like uh, China and Russia. But I think, you know, uh, Russia, uh, you know, it increasingly looks like more of a liability to China, uh, especially as the war yeah, uh, in Ukraine deepens and 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 Russia uh, performs more poorly. I don't think there will be a, a clear break in relations, but I don't anticipate China to change course after the Party Congress and start providing material support to Russia that it's previously not provided. Um, you know, China is effectively supporting the sanctions by abiding by them, even though it does not recognize them. Um, I don't think that will change either because Chinese firms. Uh, with, or elements of the Chinese economy could get caught in the crosshairs of secondary sanctions. And again, it's not clear why, why China would want um, to pay that kind of a price. And perhaps strategically, you know, to some degree, right, uh, Russia keeps the war, um, keeps uh, the United States very much anchored in Europe um, and, yeah. and less focused on Asia, all, all else equal. And so I, I don't think it's gonna deepen further uh, I, I would note in the recent meeting, there was no limits, there was no reference to the no limits friendship. Um, and, you know, this is not unrelated to Liu Chung's, I think it's not unrelated to Liu Chung's 
sort of departure from the foreign ministry because he was in charge of Russia relations yeah. and probably played a very strong hand in that the drafting of that statement and kind of the implications it had for China, uh, which I think strategically were costly. And so yeah, I think China will maintain ties with Russia to the degree that it's useful for China, but I don't see China viewing Russia as an ally that it has to sacrifice no. you know, its own blood and treasure uh, to support or to defend. And, and that's, I think, kind of playing out in their their approach to Ukraine. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I think to kind of summarize the, the thrust of all these discussions we've had, uh, it sounds like at the party Congress, we're quite likely to see um, a, a significant amount of personnel change, particularly uh, towards younger, more expert or technocratic uh, kinds of officials in the foreign policy and defense policy areas. Um, that over these critical issues of national security in the region or, or along the frontier for China, uh, these are all very difficult situations, uh, but not ones that are likely to shift uh, in the imminent future uh, from China's point of view. If anything, it seems as though the most problematic one may even be the Korean Peninsula uh, from, from, from this analysis, which is interesting. Uh, way to think of it, uh, and, and I think important uh, for everybody to consider. Uh, in terms of these big power relationships, also, it doesn't seem like the party Congress is going to shift anything uh, too major, uh, or at least not very likely to. Uh, so let me circle back to one aspect of personnel, and just mm. leave one question there, right. and then we can open up to some questions from the audience, because we've got three or four. Um, but in terms of personnel, there's been a lot of debate in the community of observers looking at this uh, in different places, in Japan and the US, uh, here in the UK and elsewhere, um, around the question of should Xi Jinping appoint uh, or, or elevate to the Politburo Standing Committee or wider Politburo or other high echelons of party leadership a younger cohort of potential successors or should he stick with loyalists as mm -hmm. though these are mutually exclusive, which I don't think they necessarily are. Right. Um, but if he indeed does opt for this kind of generational turnover uh, that we talked about earlier, uh, that you seem to think is quite likely, at least in these critical areas, might that actually signal some desire to move towards a succession endgame? Uh, over, say, the next five to 10 years rather than the next 15 to 20 years? You know, might this be a way of kind of telegraphing, in other words, is the intention of Xi Jinping to serve one or two more terms rather than three or four more terms, if he could last four more terms, let's right. say? I mean, I think, it, you know, I guess what I would be looking for is anyone who is elevated to the Politburo at this Congress, who would be able to serve um, for three terms? Politburo or Politburo Standing Committee? Politburo, right? right? So someone who could start out on the Politburo mm -hmm. at the 20th Party Congress, yep. maybe move up to the Standing Committee. Um, at the 21st. At the 21st, and then maybe become General Secretary at the 22nd. Mm -hmm. um, I think Ding Xuexiang is young enough to do that. I'd have to... Mm check. Um, but, but I think those are the kinds of appointments that are very interesting uh, because, again, if seven up, eight down holds as a general rule, um, which I, I think right for the last two decades it has um, right. for party positions, then, I mean, Wang Tushan is an exception, but it wasn't a party position. I don't think the vice presidency has an age limit tied to it. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but but in, in any event, um, um, I think you would, you know, it, that would be one, one way of thinking about it. Or the other way to think about it is someone, anyone who's elevated to the Politburo now, uh, who would certainly be able to be, to serve two terms, uh, such that they could enter to the standing committee as general secretary um, at the next party Congress, uh, mm -hmm. and thus perhaps stay longer regardless of their age at the 22nd party Congress, right? Um, and so that, I think that's kind of the age mix where it's very interesting. And you know, this current standing committee, right? It's what has three people who are 67. Yeah. Who don't necessarily have to step down, right? Um, they also don't necessarily have to be reappointed. 
right? So that there's flexibility here. Um, so I think another interesting element just along your lines of thinking is uh, would all the 67 year olds in essence be asked to step down or would at least more than one of them be asked to step down or maybe even one um, such that there is sort of greater opportunity uh, to have a holding pattern of the of somewhat newer people um, and then move on to perhaps something, you know, uh, in terms of succession. Uh, you know, I mean, Xi Jinping is a close student of history, mm. especially Soviet history. Uh, he must be a close student of Chinese history as well, but doesn't talk about it as much. Um, but, you know, it, it is clear that, that um, or you know, succession obviously is a very fraught issue in Chinese politics. Yes. I look at all of Mao's uh, chosen successors. The Hua Guofeng, Guofeng survives as a successor, largely because Mao dies right, relatively uh, soon uh, thereafter. Um, uh, Deng's various efforts at this. And so it can also create a lot of instability in the party. Um, and this has done so under very different sort of configurations of party state relations. And so, so I think, um, you know, you know, there's a tension in Xi Jinping, right, between strengthening the party and strengthening himself. Um, and well, at some point he feel confident enough that that sort of the party can be transferred such that it maintains it, uh, its sort of dominance and strength in Chinese society, or will, uh, will it become so brittle, right? And, and also create perhaps growing dissatisfaction at younger sort of elements of the party that are very important to running you know, the country yeah. uh, such that, that, that it kind of hampers the achievement of other policy goals. Because again, right, Xi Jinping is a very ambitious leader, whether it's in, in the economy and technological upgrading and military modernization. And, and these are all things that I, you know, all complex issues that um, lend themselves to technocratic and not political solutions. And, and that's, a, I think, a balance he has to strike. I have no way of knowing what will happen in two weeks uh, on this score, except that I think the age is on the broad, on the polyper overall will be very interesting element to track and to see who may have some kind of longevity um, uh, to, 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 be, um, to be involved uh, at, the, at that very high level for some time. Oh, I, I agree. I mean, I think uh, critically, it'll be very important to see what happens to Li Keqiang. Yeah. Um, if, if he remains on the Politburo Standing Committee or not, um, because theoretically he could stay on. Uh, he's not among the oldest people on that committee. Um, but if he does, it creates much narrower room for maneuver uh, for Xi Jinping in terms of setting up a succession game later, right? Whereas the other three uh, who are also potentially of the age to stay on look to me like they'd be less problematic uh, and easier also to phase out after one more term. Right. Uh, you know, Li Keqiang's already been on there now for three terms. Um, along with Xi Jinping himself on the Politburo Standing Committee. Right. But yes, yeah, so that's interesting. So if we see sort of the elevation of people in their early 50s, let's say, yeah. uh, that would be a very good signal that uh, succession planning may be afoot, or at least that succession politicking and jockeying is likely to begin yeah. um, at some point in the next few years. Whereas if we see a repeat of kind of what happened the last two times, actually, uh, in 2012 and 2017 at the uh, 18th and 19th party congresses, if the standing committee is stacked with, for lack of a better term, oldsters, um, most of whom are going to have to retire after one term, then it's pretty clear that that is looking at a longer succession game. Yeah, the other element here is just the, the age of the central committee. Yeah, yeah, that's um, a very good point. On the assumption that that's really where a possible successor resides, even if they are not immediately on the Politburo, uh, broader Politburo this time, but, um, and just more generally, like how many people on the current central committee would have kind of three party Congresses left in their, left, yeah. left in their careers. Um, right. Um, well, and then this other question of balancing sort of the strength of the party versus personal strength of the leader. Um, I think another way to think of it as well is that it's not just is the party so brittle that C cannot leave it, but it's also you know, even if the party is strong, 
is he personally safe retiring, especially given the way that early in his tenure, he went after retired officials and generals and so on uh, in the anti-corruption campaign. Right. Um, it's not an easy thing to see, to say that uh, a leader would be safe in retirement. And I think he would have to feel sort of personally secure, uh, even if the party, maybe especially if the party is strong, uh, in, in stepping down. Right. Okay, let, let's open up for questions, though, um, from the audience. We have several. I'll give a bunch of them to you because I know we're sort of time limited. Okay. So I'll give you the first three that we have in, in the hopper. Um, okay. The first one uh, comes from Mehdi Akarie, uh, who asks, does the current CCP constitution allow a president or chairman for life? Um, my impression is there's no restriction in the CCP constitution on terms. Is that right? No, I, I, my understanding is there's no there's no term limits specified for the general secretary of the party mm. or for um, chair of the, of the Central Military Commission. And then the term you know, limits were removed on um, on you know, the pre state president as well, right in 2018. In 2018, April yeah. 2018, the yeah. state constitution was changed. I think, yeah. yeah, that's an important point of clarification, perhaps for, um, for the question. The but right there, but there are these still these age rules about yeah. when you can be promoted to mm -hmm. the Politburo, you know, um, a ministerial level position and so forth. That um, I think are I forget which regulations they are set out in, but I believe there there is some general guidance uh, mm -hmm. that the party follows uh, for all of those. Well, I think Damien Ma at Macro Polo or, or Marco Polo has has this um, uh, set out um, right. in a new blog post. Um, for anyone who wants to follow up. Great. And the next question we have uh, from Jason Kelly at the University of Cardiff. Uh, what kinds of sources do you find particularly useful in pondering perspective senior personnel changes in Chinese security and defense? That's a really great question. We don't have a lot of great sources, um, to be honest. Uh, you know, there's, there's the Hong Kong rumor mill, uh, which is, um, Sometimes right, you know, uh, uh, but sometimes not right. And like I, I've always believed we need a pundit accountability project, um, or uh, you know, um, uh, and so so I think uh, one can look at what's discussed in the Hong Kong press. One can look at their career paths. I think perhaps more importantly, um, one can look at potential uh, ties, especially with Xi Jinping or with other senior military officers that are viewed as being a particularly close to Xi Jinping, um, and then make some guesses um, from there. I think also just looking at past practice and seeing, I mean, nothing is ever that stable in Chinese politics, but there are sort of patterns that recur in terms of kinds of appointments. And so that's why at least I'm quite skeptical. We'd have two vice chairmen of the CMC who are both kind of career political commissars. It just strikes me as highly unusual. And if it does happen, it has real implications for kind of modernization and party kind of uh, party army relations. Great. So next question is from Mike Du of Durham University, mm -hmm. uh, who asks, uh, do you expect to see some shift in China's foreign policy after the Congress? In particular, China may rethink its relationship with the US and Russia. My sense from your thought provoking conversation is that China is very likely to continue what it has been doing and we will be seeing a more confrontational China from a Western perspective. Is that correct? Well, I think China will continue what it's doing, but I think it could be more confrontational with, with the West and it's been. Uh, <laughs> and so that, that, that is sort of an open question. Um, you know, there's some analysis out there. I think Yun Sun at Stimson has made this argument, right? That she might become more or will China will at least maintain its current assertiveness after the Congress vote, but could become more assertive um, to include becoming more confrontational with the US. But I think that's driven more by US, the dynamics in US China relations than the party Congress itself. Uh, there may have been a tactical pause, perhaps, um, to maintain you know, some or, or to remove the possibility of external crises leading up to the Congress so that didn't become an issue in preparations. 
on this. So at least at a minimum on, on this line of thinking, we'll, we'll return to the way things were before. But I think, you know, US-China relations are not, you know, are, are in steady decline, but I don't think that's a function of, it's a function of the policies that, that the countries are adopting and how each other view those policies that's driving it, which I think is separate really from uh, issues relating to the party Congress. Right, this is a broader structural yeah. trend. So it's a broader structural a, trend, yeah. right? Um, yeah. in, and um, I mean, I hope we find a floor uh, mm. in the relationships. I'm not advocating decline for the sake of decline at mm. all, uh, but, but nevertheless, that seems to be the trajectory that both countries are, are moving towards and are finding a hard way of avoiding. And we have a very last question from Mackenzie Linden that just came in, uh, who is at the Foreign Affairs Institute of Sweden. Uh, what are likely to be the changes to the party constitution? Uh, what are the main points of the work report going to be? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you in, I think, uh, what is it? Today is the fourth. We expect, so I'll tell you in 12 days. In 12 days. Well, um, if, if we even see the work report. On yeah. I mean, no, the party constitution is interesting though, right? On these personnel questions, you know, they're, they're new, new personnel policies could be written in that are more favorable to Xi Jinping. I don't know what, I can't say in advance what I think they might be. Um, you know, we could see something like the global development initiative being written in. Mm -hmm. We could see, you know, there's speculation that Xi Jinping thought will be yeah. um, written in in a new way, i.e. not the full, uh, much more tortured phrase, but just Xi Jinping thought. Uh, we may see similar, um, uh, you know, elements being created. You know, we could see the the addition of a helmsman title uh, mm -hmm. or, or way of describing Xi. We could see the return to party chairman. Core uh, leader. Or leader. I don't know. I mean, they're, they're sort of... Yeah, you know, the party can. You know, I mean, the beauty here is, the party can do what it wants in the sense that it's not really constrained by the current constitution or charter. Is I like to use the word charter just to keep the state constitution and the party kind of rules separate in my own mind. But 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 they're not really limited by what I mean. What the current charter says as to how the party can structure itself, and in some ways it's more dynamic than the state constitution. And so. I, th I think uh, the question raises a very important issue of what to track um, um, in terms of uh, what to look for yeah. uh, down the road. And that would be uh, changes to the party charter, absolutely. I mean, the work report, if I had to guess, uh, we, we will have seen most of what will be in it in other outlets already. Um, but of course, there can be new emphases on certain areas. And so, um, you know, I, I'll just be keen to see what is in the foreign affairs and sort of national defense sections as it relates to sort of uh, how China is thinking about implementing, you know, its its 2035 and 2049 goals. Mm. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I know we're pretty much out of time. Just was there anything else that you wanted to add by way of conclusion or last? I just want to thank you for the opportunity. It's great to spend uh, some time with you. Um, look look forward to to seeing uh, seeing you again in the future. Definitely. Um, and, and hopefully doing this in person before too long. Yes, that would be delightful. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to everyone online who's joined us. Um, and to anyone who may later watch the recorded version. Uh, it's been wonderful to have everyone here. And thank you all for your questions as well. Thanks and good evening.